Today we're in Romans chapter 11. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 16 as we continue our uh, series here looking at the book of Romans. We've arrived at chapter 11, and today we're going to look at the first 16 verses, but we'll begin by reading verses 1 through 6 and then getting into our study. Romans chapter 11, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 6. Paul writes, I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah? How he pleads with God against Israel saying, Lord, they have killed your prophets, torn down your altars. I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what does the divine response say to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no longer of works, otherwise grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace, otherwise work is no longer work. Now, to develop this, we need to remember the context. The Apostle Paul has been writing concerning the nation of Israel, and he presented Israel basically from two standpoints. He presented Israel from, one, God's sovereignty, and then secondly, God's sovereignty and man's will. Now, in chapter 9, he had been writing from the position of God's sovereignty how that God had chosen his children. And he had said in chapter 9, verse 7, nor are they all children because they are seed of Abraham, but in Isaac your seed shall be called. So he was recalling how the nation of Israel had Abraham as its father, how that God had given to Abraham a promise that he would be giving to him a son. He's reminding them how that the son was to be a son of promise, but that Sarai, Abram's wife, had given Hagar to Abram, and he had conceived a child with, with, with Hagar, and that child's name was Ishmael. And what Paul had been illustrating is that though Ishmael had been born and was the firstborn, God sovereignly chose Isaac. And so in Isaac, the uh, promises would be fulfilled. So he is speaking concerning God's sovereign decision in choosing Isaac over Ishmael. But later on in chapter 10, he wrote concerning Israel's stubborn refusal to respond to God. And when he speaks concerning Israel's stubborn refusal, that alludes to human will. As a matter of fact, in chapter 10, he concluded at verse, verse uh, 21 by saying, To all Israel, he says, All day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. And so he illustrated Israel's willful unbelief. They'd been consistently disobedient, stubbornly resistant to him over their history. And that's why Jesus in Matthew 23, 37 through 39 would say, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I wanted to gather you, but you, he said, were not willing. So on the one hand, he speaks concerning God's sovereignty. On the other hand, he speaks concerning human will. And so Paul is answering the question, will Israel's stubbornness result in their never being saved? Will God ultimately and forever reject Israel? Seeing that Israel rejected Messiah, what will become of them as a people? Now, he already prepared his readers for this section in chapter 9. In verse 27, he had said, Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved. So he spoke of a remnant. So in this portion of scripture, he clarifies what he referred to earlier. Now, in Romans 11, verse 1, he begins by saying, I say then, has God cast away his people? So has God discarded and replaced his people, speaking of Israel, with another people? Have they been replaced? 
Well, we're going to see that his answer is no. God has not replaced them. God has not discarded them forever. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 11 gives us a promise. God said, for I am with you, says the Lord, to save you. Though I make a full end of all nations where I have scattered you, yet I will not make a complete end of you, but I will correct you in justice. I will not let you go altogether unpunished. Jeremiah 46, 28, do not fear, O Jacob, my servant, for I am with you, declares the Lord. Though I completely destroy all the nations among which I scatter you, I will not completely destroy you. I will discipline you, but only with justice. I will not let you go entirely unpunished. I, he said, will not completely destroy you. He said, I will not make a complete end of you. So, Paul is speaking concerning the fact that God continues to have a work that he'll do in Israel. Now, we need to remember that, according to chapter 9, verse 6, not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. You see, Israel is not simply natural descent, but is spiritual. The way that you're brought into relationship with God is through faith in Christ. And just because somebody biologically is born Jewish doesn't automatically mean that they're part of the Israel that is referred to as being a spiritual entity. Uh, in Matthew chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, uh, the word says, Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not think to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father, for I say unto you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. It's always been a matter of faith for you to enter into the promises of God. Just because somebody may be genetically uh, Jewish doesn't mean that that individual is automatically part of, of God's uh, remnant or God, God's people. Uh, it, it says in Romans 4 and 9, we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. And so Abraham himself it was somebody who was saved by faith. And so when he says in chapter 11, verse 1, I say then, has God cast away his people? The answer is no, certainly not. But he goes on to say, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. So he's saying, I'm not a convert to, to the faith of Israel. I'm not a Gentile who came to faith in, in God um, through conversion. He's saying, I was born as a descendant of Abraham, and I'm from one of the 12 tribes. And he's saying, I am a person who is born as a Jew, but he's a great example of a Christian Jew. And so he's pointing out that God has a work that he's doing in the nation of Israel. He's pulling people out that you can have a Jewish background, but be a believer in Messiah. That's the point he's making. So he develops it in verse 2 when he says this, God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed your prophets, torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life? But what does the divine response say to him? Shut up, Elijah, you're bothering me. No, that's not what it says. It says, I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Even so then, at this present time, there's a remnant according to the election of grace. He begins to speak and uses as an illustration what took place in the life of a prophet of Israel, a man that we know by the name of Elijah. Elijah's life is recorded in the Old Testament book of 1 Kings, beginning in chapter 17 and up to 2 Kings chapter 2. The portion of scripture that Paul is referring to is what is called 1 Kings chapter 19. In order to understand what he's referring to, though, we need to remember the, the events of chapter 18. So in 1 Kings chapter 18, the Bible records a famous encounter that this man, this prophet by the name of Elijah had with certain false prophets in a place called Mount Carmel. And there he challenged these false prophets of Baal and Asherah in order to show Israel who is the true God. There were 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah, and they gathered together. And he issued a challenge, and what he did is he had two bulls. They were cut into pieces. They were placed on some wood, but there was no fire that was lit. And he challenged them. And what he said to them is, call on your gods. And the one who answers with fire, he is the true God. Well, the false prophets took one of the bulls, they slaughtered, butchered it, they placed it on the wood, 
And the Bible says, from morning until noon, they cried out and they leaped about the altar, but there was no answer. And so according to 1 Kings 18, 27 through 29, so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them. And he said, cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he's meditating or he's busy. That's a euphemism for saying he's in the bathroom. Or he's on a journey. Perhaps he's sleeping and must be awakened. So they cried aloud cut themselves, as was their custom, with knives and lances until the blood gushed out on them. And when midday was passed, they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. But there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention, which is the picture of the futility of worshiping a false god. There's no voice to answer. There's no one paying attention. And Elijah, they're watching this all take place, and it starts early, and it's going into the late afternoon. And so what does he do? Well, he calls the people to himself. He takes 12 stones and repairs the broken altar. He digs a trench. He then begins to fill the trench with large water pots of water to the point where the trench is now overflowing with water. And as he does that, he, he prays a simple prayer. There's no screaming. There's no yelling. There's no cutting himself. He just issues a very simple prayer. He says in 1 Kings 18, 37, Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. I have been around when people have raised their voice and screamed as if God is deaf and he can't hear their cry. God can hear your cry if you just whisper it. He can hear your cry if you just think it. He has the ability to do that. We don't have to go out and do crazy things, cut ourselves, bleed all over ourselves, and scream at the top of our lungs all day. And that's why Elijah is watching this, because it's futile. There's no one listening. No one's going to answer. No one's paying attention. And all he needs to do is just speak to the Lord and say a very simple prayer. And that's what he does. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God, that you have turned their hearts back to you again. And God answers. God answered by fire. It consumes the offering as well as drying up all the water. The result, the people cried out, the Lord, he is God. And as a result of that, he took those false prophets and according to the law of Moses, he executed them. Now after this victory, he's pursued by the patroness of the false prophets, a woman by the name of Jezebel. Her name has found its way into American common culture. If a woman's mad at another woman because that woman has been doing something wrong, what she call her? She well, calls her a lot of names, but she also calls her Jezebel. Because the Jezebel is a woman of no reputation, of ill repute. And so Jezebel comes after him. He's discouraged. He's been fleeing. He's spiritually exhausted. And so what does he do? Well, in 1 Kings 19, verse 4, he simply prays again. This time he says to him, just take my life. Sam, I'm all alone. And uh, you might as well just take me. And that's when the Lord begins to speak to him. And God makes it very clear to him. He says, I have reserved for myself 7,000 men. There's a remnant. And that's what Paul is referring to, a remnant of believers. You are not by yourself. There are others, 7,000. You think you're by yourself. You're not by yourself. There are thousands of people in this nation who are still followers, he's saying. Years ago, I was in college, a secular college, a non-Christian college. I was in the library, and they had these booths that you would sit in, and they had dividers between you and the person next to you and the person in front of you. And as I was there seated and I was doing a report of some sort, I, I could hear, you know how libraries are quiet, or they're supposed to be anyway. I could hear somebody talking, and it was a few rows away, and I couldn't really ascertain where he was at. But I could hear him speaking, and what it was, I, I, I heard him, he's speaking so loudly, he was witnessing, he was sharing his faith in Christ with somebody who was seated next to him, and, and that's what he was doing. He was talking about Jesus, and I could hear him, and I could talk, I heard him talking about, you know, sin and judgment and salvation. I could hear him witnessing. So when I heard him witnessing, I, I remember just beginning to pray for him and saying, you know, a simple prayer, Father, just fill him with wisdom, give him the ability to communicate, touch that young man he's speaking to right now that he might come to faith in Christ. Very simple prayer. 
but I waited because the conversation was coming to a conclusion and, and the person who was being witnessed who was about to stand up and leave and he was saying, I'll see you later. So I knew he was going to stand up and so I stood up where I was at to see where this guy was. And the guy who was being witnessed to stood up and he's still talking and turns and walks away. So when he walked away, I got up from where I was seated and I came walking around and I approached this guy who had been witnessing. I'd never seen him in my life, I'd never met him in my life. I didn't know him, but I saw him and, and I walked up to speak to him. But when I walked up to him, somebody from another side of the library came and also intersected. And so I was there talking to this guy next to this other guy. And the first guy who came, a uh, uh, second guy actually, who came to speak to this man who was witnessing, a young man who was witnessing, said to him, you're, you're a believer in Christ? And the young man said, yeah, I'm born again. And I said, I want you to know that I could overhear your conversation. And I was praying for you as you were sharing. And this other fellow who had come and met us there said, I was too. Now, in that school and in that library at that time, I'm sure my new friend who was witnessing felt all alone. He was the only person there sharing. It wasn't a Christian school. And yet there were two people in the same library at the same time overhearing the conversation, praying for him. Never think that you are alone. You're not. You may be thinking on the job site right now. You may be thinking, I'm the only believer here. It may not be so. There may be others. You just haven't met them yet. You may be in school in a classroom, and as you're seated in the classroom, you're thinking, I'm the only believer here. And there are a lot of unbelievers. Yes, that's true. But you'll never know. I remember I was in a class and at the same school, a different class, political science class. And the teacher had given to us a responsibility. He said, I'm going to give to you a word, and you're going to give an impromptu speech concerning that word. I will select the word when I bring you up. And so it's like 30 kids in that young people in this college class and uh, I'm just waiting, and he's giving different words every class until finally, after a few weeks, it's my turn. And, and I go walking up, and I was 24, 25 at the time, and I go walking up. And he says, David, this is your word. The word that you're going to speak on is freedom. Now, I'm in a political science class in a secular university. As far as I know, I'm the only believer in Christ there because the other people who have gotten up and shared haven't said anything about the Lord. And I still remember when, it, when he said, your word is freedom. I said, freedom. What is freedom? And I began to speak. And I said, listen, Jesus Christ said, if a man is, is, is a sin, in sin, he's a slave to sin. But Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples, and you're going to be set free by Jesus Christ. And I said, freedom is freedom from sin. It's bondage. Jesus Christ sets you free. And I preached the gospel to the class. When I did that, one of the kids who was in the class with me that I didn't know, all of a sudden I hear her go, praise the Lord. So there were two of us in the class. And you never know. You never know. You may feel like you're stepping in the lion's den and they're going to devour you. But there's another believer there. At least you'll pray grace when that lion eats you up <laughs> on your behalf. But that's what happens, guys. Never think that you're by yourself. You are not. The enemy is trying to isolate you, make you feel you're crazy for the things you believe. No doubt about that. We have a governor who signs into law things that are crazy right now, right? And you think, I'm the only person thinking this? You're not the only person. There are others like us in this room who believe the righteousness of God stands and it's right to believe in him. And we don't have a problem saying that. It's true. But you can feel alone. You can go on the job site and people will say, what did you do this weekend? I went to church. All oh, those churches, man, they're just filled with, with, with nonsense and they're stealing from me and they have their opinion. And you can say, after a while, I don't feel like saying anything. But you're not alone. There's a remnant. God is still moving. There are people still being saved. God is still working. He's in action. And Paul is saying, listen, God has always had a remnant. Even the time when Elijah thought he was the only one and God said, what's wrong, Elijah? I alone am your prophet. No, you're not. I've got 7,000 who have not bowed their knee to Baal. You are not alone. And so Paul is speaking concerning this remnant. And he's saying that these people do exist and God still has that. Verse 5 again, even so at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. These are believing Jews. And if by grace then it's no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. If it's of works, it's no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. 
So you're saved by grace. This remnant has always been. They're saved by grace, but not holding to the law of Moses. That's not what saved them. Not trying to keep the commandments of God. That didn't save them. He's saying this is a remnant according to the election of grace. In 2 Timothy 1.9, he has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. And so it's, it's always been of grace. Well, what then? Verse 7. Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were hardened. Just as it is written, God has given them a spirit, a stupor, eyes that they should not see, ears that they should not hear to this very day. David said, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back always. So Israel, the non-believing Jews, he's saying, have been seeking by law, by the law of Moses, what God has given by grace. Now, he had said in chapter 10, verses 2 and 3, as he was speaking of Israel, I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. And so he's making it very clear that they are attempting to have a relationship with God through their own efforts, and they're not submitted to what God has said. So what has been the result? Well, he speaks of it in this way, a hardness of heart, a mental callousness, a spiritual dullness. National Israel is hardened against the gospel of Jesus Christ. He says in verse 8, God has given them a spirit of stupor and blind eyes. Stupor speaks of numbness or insensibility. That blindness, they've seen God's wonders, yet they've refused to believe. And that's been the history of Israel. You can go back in the history and watch it. You can, you can see it in the ten plagues that God brought against Egypt to deliver the children of Israel. How God provided for them in the wilderness with manna and water that was brought from a rock. How God, from the history on, all the way through the time of Christ, had given to them opportunity after opportunity miracles and prophets and scripture and so many other things that were beneficial to them and how that they remained insensible to the things of God, dull to it. They grew dull. They refused to believe. They have a spiritual blindness. When Paul refers to this in 2 Corinthians three fourteen through 16, he says, their minds are blinded. For until this day remains the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament which veil is done away in Christ. But even to this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, uh, when it's taken away, they'll turn to the Lord. To the Lord. And so there's a veil over their, over their heart. And that's why he says in verse 9, David says, let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block. The table represents safety and feasting. He's saying, may that become a trap. When you have a Thanksgiving dinner or Christmas or an Easter or whenever you have all the family over in, and you, uh, you set the table, right? And you get, have all this food that is there for the, for the family. I don't know about you. I, I don't know if you even invite friends over or if you go and visit your family. But there's something about the table at that time on, in holidays that is very special. And so you're at the table. It's really supposed to be a place of security and safety. It's not supposed to be a place where you fight over the meal. It's supposed to be a place where you're enjoying fellowship with your family. So it ought to be a place of safety. It ought to be a place of security. It ought to be a place where you're enjoying the blessings that God has provided. So what is David saying? Let their table become a snare and a trap. He's saying, as they eat of the law, may they be judged by the law. If you're going to be made righteous by the law, it's going to come back and be your judge. In John 5, 45 and 46, do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believed Moses, you'd believe me, for he wrote about me. You cannot keep the law, Paul is saying. The Jews could not become righteous by obedience to the law because the law that Moses gave was intended to communicate a variety of things, 
but especially it was intended to communicate the sinfulness of sin and the need for a savior. So if you try to keep the commands and do these things in your own strength and power without faith, you're doomed, and that which you were trusting in will turn against you ultimately. He says, and I find this interesting, have they stumbled to never recover? Will they always be rejected? And he's saying, no, there's a purpose in this. God will use the Gentiles to cause them to be jealous. Notice verse 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, if their fall is riches for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? Have they stumbled to never recover? No, their fall means riches for the Gentiles. God is using Gentiles to cause Israel to be jealous. I was um, listening to a Jewish man speak years ago, and not, he's not a believing Jew. He's not a Christian. Just a Jewish man who was speaking, and he said, doesn't the Bible say that God is going to use Christians to make Jews jealous? Well, we just read that. That's exactly what it says. Through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. So he said... Doesn't the Bible say that Christians are supposed to provoke Jews to jealousy? Then he said this, I have never met a, a, a Christian that I've been jealous over anything that they have. Never met one that has ever had anything that I want. Sadly, that's, that can be generally true. In the history of the church, we haven't always been as faithful to the call and commands of God. And there are times when we have shown terrible disregard for those who don't know the Lord. We don't even care. I have a, a friend that I had made I haven't seen in many years, a, a guide in, in Israel, a Jewish woman. Her name was Helen. And uh, she was one of these outspoken women. I mean, I really liked her because she just let you know what she was thinking at any given time. And I appreciated her. She was very intelligent, a great guide. We liked her a lot. As a matter of fact, she grew to like Marie and me because we just, we obviously liked her. We cared about her. And we'd even asked for her to be our guide. We liked her that much. And so she began to like us over the years because she guided us more than once. And finally, one day we were checking into our hotel. And in this hotel, it's a secular hotel. There's a, an area of this hotel. They have the bar and everything, and, and we're standing as our group was checking in, and she was just sharing with us, and she said, that bar right there? We said, yeah. She said, you ought to see what I've seen at that bar. She then began to mention to me the groups that she has guided, and some of the groups that she mentioned, one in particular that she mentioned was, was, was a, a group that, it, were I to mention the organization, everybody in this room would automatically know. And then she mentioned names of people that I've seen on TV sharing before, and I knew these, these teachers by, by name, not by friendship or anything. I, I knew who they were. And she said, well, you know this particular organization? I said, yes. She said, do you know these teachers? And she names a few. And I said, yes, I'm aware of them. I don't, they're not my friends, but yeah, I know who they are. She says, well, let me tell you something. You see that bar there? I said, yeah. She said, when we've been here before and that group has checked in, she said, the people who are leading that group, who do all this teaching, wait until they go to bed. And when all of their, their pilgrims go to bed, they come back to the bar and they drink. She says, and they don't care that I see this because after all, she's just a Jew. What does that matter? And that's what she told me. They don't care what they're doing in front of me and us because after all, they're just Jews is what she said. And I apologized on behalf of the, the church, on behalf of this organization. I said, I am so sorry. Forgive us because that's not the spirit of the Lord. That's not what God has for us. We're not to be that way. But it, it, it caused me to recall what that Jewish man who, who had said, I have yet to see anything that a Christian has that makes me jealous. Our lives are supposed to be provoking people to want what we have. 
And I guarantee you, every person who calls upon the name of the Lord and has spoken that openly to other people has people who are watching to see whether or not we're true to our word. Not to cause us to have the spirit of paranoia in here running around wondering who's watching us now. But the bottom line is, even when you don't know it, there are people watching you. We know that. There are people noticing you. You know that, whether it's in the neighborhood, whether it's uh, on the job, whether it's in school, whether it's when you're not even aware that people are noticing. My father's in the hospital. We're in the waiting room. It's a small room, Chino Hospital. Several members of my family are there, my mom, my wife, children. We hear over the, um, the speaker, code blue. My mom turns to me. I'm seated next to her. She turns and looks at me. She says, that's for your father. And I say, I know. My dad was the only one in the emergency ward there in the ICU unit. I said, I know. Five to ten minutes later, the door opens. Doctor stands at the door, looks around the room. There's several people in this very small room. It's not more than 10 by 10, 10 by 12, a small room. There are several people surrounding us and my family. He stands at the door and he says, Rosales, family? And I'm seated next to the door. And I look up and I say, that's us. And I stand up. And he begins that speech that he's given so many times. I'm sorry to have to tell you, we did all we could, that speech. And I'm representing my family. And I let him talk, and I see his mouth moving, but I'm not hearing what he's saying, other than your father's dead. And I don't respond, I just look at him. And when he's through, I say, Doctor, thank you so much. We greatly appreciate all your efforts. Thank you. My mom's just sitting there. 53 years of marriage is gone in a moment. We all stand up. I take my family by the hand. And we pray. Thank you, Father, for giving to us. Frank Rosales. Thank you. Then we go in to pay our final respects, and we come out as a family. It's very quiet, but right across from me, somebody says, that while they got up and walked to me and said to me this, they said, I'll never forget this, what are you? How do you answer that? They said, what are you? And I said, excuse me, what do you mean? What are you? I said, what do you mean? We saw, we saw what you just did when you heard that news. What are you? I smile at him and I said, what am I? I'm a Christian. And this family here is a, Christian, is a Christian family. My father just went to be with Jesus Christ. What we are is we're believers in Jesus Christ. I did not know that I was being watched. That was not in my mind. I wasn't thinking, how should I act? Oh, I'm a pastor. I better show faith. I better stand up and say, well, bless you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I didn't do that. I did what anybody does. I listened to the best of my ability, and I took it to Jesus. But that meant something to the people in that room. That's the thing that causes people to want to know, who is this God that you say you worship, who can give you this kind of peace in the middle when an explosion happens, when your whole world is, is gone in a moment. Who is this God that you worship? 
because the average person, yes, I still have tears years later because it impacted me that deeply. But I know that beyond anything else, what kept me going then and kept me going all the way to now is God, the Spirit of the Lord, the truth of his promises, the transformed life, the blessings of Jesus that he has poured into our lives and the hope of eternity that we have because of him. And that's what we have. And so when the question is asked, what are you? I am a believer in Jesus Christ who conquered the grave. He lives. He ever lives to make intercession for me. He's prepared a place for me. I will be with him. My father's there. My mom's there. I will be there. That's what I am. And that causes people to see and say, whatever it is that you have, that's what I need. You see, I don't want to go out and say, what am I? I'm a Christian, so that means I can still party. That means that I can still sleep around. That means that I can go out and club. I can do all that I want and still go to heaven. It's not that way at all. When Jesus Christ comes into your life, he, tra he changes. He transforms everything. Your priorities, everything changes at that time. And now you're centered on him. And that kind of centering on Christ, that desire for God is so huge. It's so immense that your whole life is changed. And you're not doing it just to impress people. You're doing it because you love him. And yeah, you can go through pain. You do, indeed you do. Yes, you go through loss, of course. But my Bible says that my God shall wipe away every tear. There's no pain. There's no sorrow. There is no sickness. There is no more death. There's just life. It's been swallowed up through Jesus Christ, you see. And that's, that's what makes us different. And so Paul is saying that God has used the Gentiles to provoke Israel. When, when they see, Israel sees the blessings of God upon the Gentiles. In 2 Corinthians 8, 9, Paul said, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, and that you through his poverty might become rich. And so somebody says, Oh man, I want to become a Christian so I can become rich. I can walk around with a lot of money in my wallet at all times. But is that what he's referring to? You come to Christ and you'll always have money in your wallet? No, he's speaking concerning the fact that God gives us spiritual blessings. Does God provide for us in every way, including financially? Of course. But is that the reason why we came to Christ? No. Ephesians chapter 1 refers to our spiritual blessings that we have. And when you read chapter 1, you see Paul beginning to, to enumerate them. We have adoption. We've been accepted. We have redemption. We have forgiveness. We have wisdom. We have the inheritance, the seal of the Holy Spirit. We have life. We have grace. We have a heavenly citizenship. And these are the things that we live in, and these are the things that cause people to take note. Now he says in verse 13, I, I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles. I magnify my ministry. If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh, and save some of them. For if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. Paul said, I have a message, and the message that I've been called to proclaim is a message to all, but I have a message that I give to Gentiles. When you begin to read the book of Acts, you note that as the day of Pentecost fully arrived in Acts chapter 2, and the Holy Spirit came upon the 120 who were there in that upper room in Jerusalem, and they were baptized by the Holy Spirit, and they left that room and poured out into the courtyard and began to speak in languages unlearned, magnifying God. You begin to see at that time, because the Holy Spirit had begun to flow in the church, the church was Jewish. And through the first several chapters of the book of Acts, you see that that they would go out to the Jew first, and then they were going to go to the Gentile. So ultimately what happens is when you begin to look at the initial chapters of Acts, you see that, that the Jews are being reached, and, and the message is going out to the Jewish people. You get to cha chapter 9, and the apostle Paul is, is saved, and the first thing he does is he begins to share with other Jews. He goes to synagogues, and you see that as a practice in his ministry until chapter 18 of Acts. When you get to chapter 18... 
Paul is in a, a, a Greek city, a city called Corinth. And while he's there, once again, he's trying to communicate the gospel of grace to the Jews. But the Jews don't want to hear it. They get angry. And so he speaks to them. It's found in Acts chapter 18, and, and uh, verse 6. And in Corinth, he says, seeing that you're refusing this, that we're going to go to the Gentiles. And so Paul magnifies his office that he was the apostle to the Gentiles. The apostle Peter had ministry to the Jews, but Paul began to focus much of his attention on Gentiles. That's why in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8, Paul said to me, who am less than the least of all saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And so he became the apostle to the Gentiles. Now he speaks in verse 15, and we'll wrap it up. He says, if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be? If the rejection of Israel resulted in Gentile salvation, what's going to happen when they come to the fullness of the knowledge of Messiah? And then he says in verse 16, if the first root is, the first root is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. First fruit, and root, that speaks of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the early believers. He's saying if the foundations are pure, then the resultant followers will be pure also. The first fruit would be the Jewish believers, and they are the foundation of Christianity. But the whole lump are those who are converted through their ministry. And God wants to do a work, and God is going to continue doing that work to this day. And ultimately, God is going to do a tremendous time of work in the nation of Israel, as we will see next time we get together. We'll close here.